I'm Hannah Savage, and for the last three and a bit years, I've been studying at the Melbourne Neuropsychiatry Centre at the University of Melbourne. During this time, I've been working to further our understanding of how the brain processes threat and safety cues within our environment, and more specifically, how we can respond flexibly when these threat and safety cues change. Being able to respond flexibly to changing sources of threat and safety within our environment is crucial for our everyday well-being and survival. In fact, there's evidence to suggest that people with an anxiety disorder are less able to do this process. They tend to get stuck on threat-related thinking and are unable to switch how they think even if it's no longer necessary. One way we can study this flexible threat and safety processing is using a very simplified experimental paradigm called Pavlovian fear reversal. Participants are shown a blue sphere that is sometimes paired with an aversive burst of white noise. Participants quickly learn that this blue sphere signals a threat cue. This yellow sphere they're presented is never paired with the noise and they quickly learn this as a safety cue. After establishing threat and safety in the first phase, in a subsequent reversal phase, this switches. And this allows us to have a look at which brain regions are involved when something that was threatening becomes safe or safety reversal learning and when something that was safe becomes threatening or threat reversal learning. I've used this paradigm in two experiments during my PhD. The first study of my PhD investigated whether healthy young people were able to do this task and which brain regions were involved when doing so. We found three brain regions seem to be particularly important in threat and safety reversal learning. These included the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex and anterior insular cortex during threat reversal learning and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex during safety reversal learning. We then tested the hypothesis that people with an anxiety disorder may be less able to do this switching process. We hypothesized that activity within these brain regions might be slightly different in an anxious population. Surprisingly, we found that people with a primary diagnosis of social anxiety disorder were just as able to complete this fear reversal task, and activity in these brain regions was not significantly different to unaffected controls. In fact, having higher levels of social anxiety symptoms actually seemed to make you better at doing the task. Participants with higher social anxiety symptoms were more able to update their responding to the new safety cue. So taken together, my PhD has helped us understand how our brain flexibly processes threat and safety cues and helped us to identify that this may not be altered in people with social anxiety disorder.